<laughs> and how many people haven't, just so that we can get a... Okay. 50-50. Oh. Yeah, so pretty 60 much. 60-40. <laughs> how many have you seen Barry Lyndon just before? Ooh, few people. Okay. How many have you seen Barry Lyndon in general? Uh, uh, <laughs> so not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> not <laughs> um, it's I great. You should watch it. Yeah, you should see it. It's really good. Um, when when you were here for the film festival, and by the way, that was like you know the m one of the more awesome opening nights that we've ever had. The favorite. Um, we were talking about the whole question of a period movie and how you went into that, how you went about it, um, and I think that you know. Obviously, you want you looked at it with very fresh eyes. The results are there on the screen. I thought that that would just be a good way to start the conversation. So it's it's just it, it was natural for me to just you know make decisions that that would lead me to making a a period film that felt you know closer to my world to the things that I want to do, um, but. It wasn't decided from the beginning. I hadn't, I hadn't a very clear idea from the beginning what it was going to be. So every step of the process, I would make decisions starting from the screenwriting and finding the tone of that and the story in that and what I wanted to focus on. Uh, and we worked on the script for many years. It took us eight years to, to complete the screenplay. I mean, not because we were working eight years consecutively, but I made other films in between, and Tony, that we worked together on the script, uh, did other stuff. Um, and from the script, and then visually, and filmically, and um, every step of the process, music, sound, um, there were decisions that needed to be made. Yeah. And But I followed them as I would with any other film. Mm -hmm. Does it give you more freedom, actually, to invent? Um, th there is the element of distance because you know it, it takes place um, so many years ago, uh, and you have that advantage because we don't really know exactly how how it was. We have certain uh, documents and you know images, and but it's 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 quite you know limited the idea that we have about that period. So that kind of opens up. Um, a lot of you know pathways to be creative and invent things, um, and that was one of the things I didn't understand why. You know, most period films, um, you know, people talk in a certain way or move in a certain way, and you know that's when it came in. I want to find a physicality that is unique to this film, and people should. Um, you know, move and stand and in a certain way, dance specifically in a, in a certain way. Uh, that's not what we expect from a film, uh, from a period film of that period. Um, so yeah, we, I guess we wanted to break conventions, but I mean, it's not like we started thinking like that. It was like what, we, we were just free in making creative decisions and just you know, f f in every department, I uh, encouraged uh, to think about things in a fresh way. The costumes, the sound, uh, and everything else. Well, I think with the costumes, for instance, didn't Sandy Powell use a mix of, um, of fabrics that were in, in common use um, and that would have been used at the court, but then also with more modern fabrics. I mean, she created something new. Yeah, no, we only used modern fabrics. Oh, we, okay. we just kept the, the, the shapes of the period. Mm -hmm. um, and But we used uh, from vintage denim uh, in the, the kitchen stuff, for instance, you might not realize, but you know, their, their uniforms are uh, denim that she found uh, to leather and plastic and most of the um, accessories, the chokers and all those things are 3D printed. Um, so everything is uh, made with contemporary material, but we just kept the, the, the shapes of the period of the costumes um, loyal to the period. And the other thing we did with costumes was like, which we, we decided early on is, was to 
limit the color palette. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly the only colors that you see are for the politicians to separate the two opposing parties with yeah. red and blue waistcoats. Um, and that's mostly uh, the, the, the color you see in the film. Otherwise, it's especially for the three leads, uh, it's black and white. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's certain decisions that you made uh, to inject things that feel very contemporary into the period. One of some of them are stylistic, and that includes your use of a certain lens. Maybe we don't want to talk too much about that and let the audience kind of experience it yeah. for themselves. But well, half of them have seen. It yeah, that's me. true. So <laughs> yeah, if you have to walk a fine line. That's right. <laughs> sitting next to somebody who hasn't seen it, don't see anything. But then also some of the language is very contemporary as well. Um, yeah, which was the earliest decision that the, the, that the language um, should be contemporary and feel contemporary that we don't really know how people spoke at the time and we didn't even try to. We just wanted it to feel more relevant and fresh. Um, so that was a very uh, decision very early on. Um, and that's that was my decision also to uh, to bring on Tony McNamara that we worked on the script for the longest time uh, because he I, I had a certain idea about the tone that I wanted for the film and I, I, I searched and I read you know loads of, of writers playwrights screenwriters playwriters sc screenwriters um, and Tony had a very specific voice that matched what I was imagining for the film uh, and that's you know what we used. I mean, we were a little bit inspired and played with the tone to sometimes, you know, fool ourselves that we're in the period, and the, it was inspired by the maybe in, by a certain uh, way that people would phrase certain things. But the the the, the language was definitely contemporary. Yeah, there's a. Um Something that I, I think Fellini said when he made Satyricon that he wanted to create a science fiction of the past. <laughs> um, and it seems to me that Kubrick could have said the same thing about Barry Lyndon, and perhaps you could even say the same of the favorite, but does that sound like an accurate kind of, you're pursuing that kind of strangeness? Um, yeah, I don't know, accurate is definitely poetic and beautiful uh -huh. <laughs> to think like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't know about accurate. Sounds nice. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but does it ring true to, I mean, you, you, you selected Barry Lyndon to be shown before the film? Not me. Oh, it wasn't <laughs> you. Oh, okay. Okay. But that, but you were, you were good with that, <laughs> right? I was good with that because it felt very uh, flattering in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, it's just cool that your film is going to be shown next to Barry Lyndon. Um, the, the funny thing about Barry Lyndon is that we just, you know, when we were making The Favourite, we try to stay away from it. We try to not even mention it because obviously, yeah. you know, we knew that ev anybody that saw the film, when you see, you know, candles and yeah. men in wigs and, you know, s near the period, you think of Barry Lyndon because it's the quintessential film. It's, it's an amazing film. It's a masterpiece. Everybody... Uh, references it. So I think, you know, in the beginning we just went like, let's not talk about Barry Lyndon. We, we all have seen it. It's amazing. There's no way to completely escape it, but mm -hmm. we're not going to be using it, you know, as a reference all the time because it's going to be very limiting. So we try to concentrate on, you know, our own uh, view on things, our own imagination, and to you know, be inspired by very different uh, kind of films. Some of them period, but also from very contemporary films as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you give a few examples? I mean, as long <laughs> as this is, you know, and this is an interesting question for any filmmaker. How do you relate to, you know, yeah. film history itself and what's your relationship to other people's movies? Well, I think firstly, we wanted to uh, look at films, at period films that have done things differently and one one of the few that stood out was uh, Peter Greenaway's The Draftsman's Contract yeah. um, which is a very stylized film very bold 
very different. Um, I think we even f found a wig of theirs and we yeah. restructured and we used. Um, because they had those amazing wigs, their, their costumes were also made by pl very plain uh, materials. I think they used mostly cotton materials, which yeah. was much plainer than one they, what they would actually be. And they also, I think, limited the color par palette quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So that was you know, a film that showed you that you know, period films can be quite different. Um, and then, you know, something very different was Cries and Whispers, Bergman's Cries and Whispers, because mm -hmm. it has this um, atmosphere with the three women in a house. And it's also kind of, I think also their, their costumes are black and white, but of course in a very bright red room uh, house. Um, uh, we, we watched Adama Deus, which is a film that I really like, and because of the tone, mm. you know, the humorous tone in a, a biopic like that. Um, uh, Madness of King George. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a great film, quite funny and uh, devastating at the same time. So tonally, again, uh, there, there were some similarities. Mm. Um, and then we looked at, you know, completely different stuff like, uh, you know, and Andrei Zulavsky films for the, <laughs> Uh, how he films and how the the camera is very free and moves and uh, um, the cremator by Euras Hertz, yeah. um, which is you know there, there's a very specific use of extreme wide angle lenses th that are contradicted with extreme close ups. It's a very interesting film. Um, yeah, film films like that and, uh, and many others, but it was mostly. Your stylistic references more than yeah, and really just mm. to be inspired by people that did things differently and yeah. just feel free to go ahead and be bold about our choices. And it wasn't like to reference anything specific that we wanted to uh, imitate, but just you know for the for our for our for my collaborators to be inspired and feel free that they could do things. You know they could look at things in different ways and uh, yeah, mostly about that. Um, it's interesting that, that, you know, the subject of, of the favorite, it could have been um, like an Alexander Corda production from the 40s or for a Gainsborough movie or something like that, and you made it into something so new. What was it in the story that drew you in the first place? Well, I guess it was something that I'd never heard of before. I mean, the, the fact that there were in, in, in reality, there were these three women that had such power at some point in time that yeah. you know um, that it, that they could affect the lives of so many other people, and uh, but also their their individual stories. They were, they felt like very interesting, uh, very different women, uh, one from the other, uh, with different goals, different history. Anne was obviously a very tragic figure. She went through a lot in her life and. Um, so it, it was interesting to me, well, you know, and I also went like a, a film with three women, you know, as, as least I've never really seen that and w that would be interesting to work with three amazing actresses. Um, the fact that it was a period film and I hadn't done one, so I wanted to, you know, uh, it, it felt intriguing uh, to see what I, can, I could do with that. Um, yeah, and the fact that it could be a very, through a very intimate story, uh, be able to show that the fact that you know the decisions of very few people affect million of others, uh, millions of others, and you know the fate of a country and the fate of a war. So it felt quite small and intimate, but also related to very uh, grand and important matters at the same time. Um, so yeah. Um. Why don't we just run the that first clip from the film just to sort of orient things. For those who haven't seen it. For those it. who haven't <laughs> seen it and for those who have, they can. Yep. It could have been the White House during the Christmas break. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you are... Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you just couldn't. I know. <laughs> I couldn't could, help it. Yeah. I'm not going to say the name. I just want um, When you were um, uh, 
I mean, actually, in any of your movies, do you begin with a long with a rehearsal process? Uh, whenever I have a chance, yeah, because um, yes. that can get expensive, right? Yeah, yeah. it can get yeah. expensive. I mean, uh, for instance, for the lobster, it, it was kind of impossible to have um, enough rehearsals because. Uh, we were filming in, in Ireland, somewhere remotely. The hotel was somewhere remotely, and uh, it was a lot of actors that were coming from a lot of different countries, and uh, they also had to come in at different uh, times because of the schedule. Um, so it was kind of impossible to, to have that. Uh, but, but usually when, I, when I'm able to, I, I do try to rehearse, and in this instance, we did have like three weeks of rehearsals which were very helpful um, to, you know, bond the whole group and try things out and instill a certain kind of uh, spirit of how we're gonna uh, approach this film. Because again, you know, the actors could come in with a very preconceived notion of, you know, what period films look like and what they're supposed to do. And uh, so it was important to just you know, showcase that we're doing this differently. And and with most of, I mean, Olivia and Rachel I had worked with before, um, so they were uh, more familiar with my ways. But also uh, Emma, because we cast her like almost two years before we actually ended up making the film. So we got to know each other as well. We were meeting in between, and as we were trying to put the film together, uh, we got to know each other uh, well. Um, so it was just a matter of, you know, um, bringing a certain kind of physicality and um, making them uh, learn their text in a certain way, which was wasn't rational, really. It wasn't intellectualized. Um, yeah, wasn't there an exercise that Olivia Coleman said that you did that was precisely to achieve that and to let go of the rational understanding of the text? Yeah, the, the whole three weeks was that. Yeah. It was just games and exercises, and yeah. it was very physical, the whole thing. And it didn't really make any sense if you're looking at it from the outside. But it was just about, um, you know, they got to know each other really well. They mm -hmm. felt very comfortable with each other. Um, you know, by the end of it, they were very free to try anything in front of their colleagues. Um, we had a lot of laughs because a lot of it was ridiculous what we were doing. Um, so it, it really instilled a very specific uh, spirit of how we're going to approach things. And then when time came to go to set, you know, they all very fair, felt felt very com comfortable and they had bonded, uh, and it helped a lot uh, the atmosphere on set. Um, is it? Fair to say that when you're working with actors, what you really want, and I, I think this is probably true of a lot of filmmakers, that you want to be surprised and you want them to surprise themselves maybe as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, again, that's why I try to avoid you know, rehearsing the scenes or as they're actually gonna be uh, in the film yeah. uh, and, and trying to um, uh, explain and analyze things of how this is supposed to be done and you know what we're expecting from the scene and what are the intentions yeah um, so yeah of course it's you, you need to um, uh, find a process that basically uh, enables the actors to feel free and mm -hmm. creative and to have the space that they you know can try things they can fail and they can feel confident yeah. and comfortable that you know we're all there for the same reasons and they're going to be protected and so basically you're just enabling them to just you know go out there and be bold and not care about how they're going to look and um, just come up with things and especially because you haven't rationalized it and you know there, there can be ideas that come from nowhere and they may, maybe they work or maybe they don't yeah uh, but it's definitely um, a direction which allows a lot of freedom and uh, a lot of time to try things in different ways, mm -hmm. um, which is what I try to do in general while we're filming. And that's that's one of the reasons that I don't like to uh, use like cinema lighting and I, I use natural light or practical lights and I don't want to have a lot of equipment around. I just want the camera and the actors. 
so we can just basically focus on that, how we film them and what they do, and not move lights around and you know change every every shot that we take and every setup, change everything and wait for the lights. It's just mm. you know me, the the actors, the camera and the sound, and we just try things and rehearse. And if something doesn't work, we change it immediately. And if we get a shot, we go to the next one right away. There's no waiting time. They mm -hmm. stay there. The, and, uh, you know, they enjoy that as well. They, they don't have to go, you know, wait for half an hour and then come back and then start again. Um, so I think that's quite important, apart from, you know, how it looks in the end. Yeah. But, but also, the film, your films are... Um, are very, look appear to be very carefully blocked. Um, it's not just a matter of letting the actors, you know, um, do. No, their they thing. are, but in yeah. the end, yeah. But we, we, you go through. You're through finding a, that together. Yeah, you go through a process, and they are very uh, precisely planned beforehand as well. Yeah. I mean, we do uh, think a lot about um, how they're going to be filmed. There's a there's a very specific plan. There's a very specific plan of how the scene plays out, but I, I like to do all that to be prepared and to, to have created a, a language, a filmic language with my collaborators, yeah. so we kind of speak the same language, but then uh, as soon as I go on set, I never look at that. And some of it is, is stays in your head anyway, yeah. some of it is you repeat it because you're the same person, so that's how you think and you repeat it. But at the same time, you have the freedom to, you know, discover new things that you didn't, you couldn't imagine, you know, sitting in a room, um, imagining how the shot is going to be and how the the actors are going to do it. Yeah. I, I like to discover it um, again on the day, on the spot, and then if we get stuck and we don't know what to do, then I go back to our notes and go like, well, let's see what we thought here and. Maybe it will help us out. And then sometimes you can discover surprising things in the cutting room too. No, I mean yeah, values yeah, of course. that you didn't even know. That you yeah, of pursued. course. Sometimes you don't know. You know, I, sometimes you don't know if you think that uh, you know you see a take and you go like, "This is never going to work." Yeah. And um, then you go into the cutting room and you discover that this is the best take because it all has to do with you know what the previous shot is and what the actor did in the other shot and where where in the film you know it takes place and it's really hard to have you know all of that in your head when you're you know doing one shot of one scene uh, and you know see a take and go like yeah that's it that's you know that's what's it going to be so um, you need to allow the the freedom and the variation in order to be able to fine tune uh, performances, the story, the character uh, during the editing process. And also, f you know, again, the structure also might need to change because it works on a different way on paper, but, you know, when you actually watch the film, um, again, it's not exactly as we imagined it, so you have to um, tweak things and change the structure slightly or find stylistic things that uh, give a different texture to the film. Uh, like, for instance, the the cards, the title cards are in the film is something that I, I came up with during the editing because <laughs> I because of the pace of the film. The pace of the film just felt so fast to me that I really needed to put some, you, you know, points. Barriers. Yeah, yeah. some, you know, there to uh, signify certain, you know, parts of the film and then you know, it became a stylistic thing as well, and we had our wonderful uh, graphic designer, my friend Vasilis, who's done uh, all of the posters of my films, you know, designed them, and, you know, it becomes, you know, part of the film that you hadn't necessarily thought of from the beginning, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, which you discover during the editing process. Yeah. Do you enjoy uh, every phase of the, f I mean, for instance, the mix? I hate every phase. Okay. The thing Great. is, um, <laughs> I always wonder why I do it. Um, but I think, I guess, it's in every phase, you know, there's these moments that are amazing and magical, and that's what keeps you going. Yeah. But a lot of it is, you know, a lot of pain and stress and... 
um, agony. Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess the you know the during the writing process when you discover the tone or the actual story or what it is going to be, there's like a you know excitement which mm -hmm. is quite unique. Um, and then, of course, the writing process takes a lot, a lot of time, and you're frustrated because you haven't finished, and you want to make the film, and Especially but it's not there yet. Especially with this one that took eight time. years. Yeah, thank God we had other films to do in between. Yeah. Um, but yeah, every part of the process, uh, f filming is the most stressful one. Mm. Uh, although it's kind of the n you 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 think it's kind of the nicer before you were there. Uh, you look back at it and go, like, oh, I wish I would be, you know, filming right now. But when you're in it, it's extremely stressful. And you, you know, you, no matter how much time you have, no matter how much money you have, it's never enough. Um, there's always the pressure of, you know, you're filming something that will stay forever. Yeah. You can't change it. And, you know, people go, you're like, you have one minute left if you want to do <laughs> that shot. Or else you're cutting into the <laughs> next day. What? Yeah. This yeah. is going to stay forever. Give me three more minutes. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's one minute. How many days did you have? Uh, I think it was uh, 40 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Filming. And reshoots? No, yeah. uh, not really. Uh, we, we did one d half a day of reshoot. We did some more of. Uh, the duck shots. <laughs> the ducks were difficult to, to <laughs> film. <laughs> they were fleeting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, not really. But uh, the rabbits were easier to handle. Right? The Those rabbits were, were very yeah. easy. Mm -hmm. You know, they just hang out. They, mm -hmm. they, ho they hopped yeah. around. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was going to be much more complicated, but the, the rabbits were quite cool. Uh, and and there are the ducks as well. I mean, we as soon as we, it, it was just <laughs> it was just difficult to follow them around, yeah. technically speaking. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but you know, you you throw some fish and they go for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you would just have to find a way to follow them because <laughs> uh, they were going fast. They were Indian runners. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that that was it. Just a you know, a few practical things. Uh, but nothing much. Do you share the movie with, do, do you like screening for people and getting feedback during the editing process? Um, a little bit, but I, 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 I like to do it when it's quite progressed. Yeah. I, I don't want to do, you know, like as soon as I have an assemble, like, oh, people, yeah. you know, see right. the film. Um, I, I like to feel confident about it to a certain extent. Right. I know that there's still a lot of work to be done, but you reach a point where you go like, I, I, I'd like to see it with other people now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's mostly, for me, it's mostly to, um, to see how I feel while I'm watching it with other people and how I feel in certain moments and certain scenes. Not necessarily, you know, what they're gonna say about the film or a scene or a character or whatever. I mean, that can be important, obviously, sometimes. But um, for me, the most important part is you know, how I feel, because while you're working, you kind of see it in a certain way, but when you're in the room with other people, you know, you get, um, yeah, you feel very different, and you're more ashamed for one scene than the others, <laughs> and, you know, you're like, oh my God, I don't want to show them this, and, you know, or you feel more confident about other things, so that, you know, tells you, you know, which parts needs more work, need more work, and where you can focus, and what you can change, and... Um, yeah, but I, I do a few uh, screenings. But it's usually a value for mo matters of clarity. Is Are people getting this, or do I have to... Yeah, there's that as well. Find it. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, we can do some questions from the audience now, maybe. Um, yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a mic coming. Ah. You can, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Melena Petro, I'm a screenwriter here in New York too. And the number one question I face when I'm writing draft shorts is, is this believable? Or you know, does that make sense? Would that really happen? Um, and when I watched The Lobster, for <laughs> me, just that whole concept was, this is so unbelievable. <laughs> but 
you know, have you ever faced questions like this during the writing process where people were like, does this sound realistic? Does this sound believable? And what is your response to that? Um, well, I, I guess I, I had a very specific course where I started from Greece making films with my friends, so we didn't really have to answer to anyone because we had to basically finance them, uh, make them, you know, borrow everything in order to make them. Everybody's basically chipping in to make the film, and so there, there wasn't such a question. So, so after having made uh, a few films like that, uh, I guess The Lobster was my first English language film, which. Uh, we made an, under a more proper uh, industry, film industry structure. Um, but I, I already had, you know, the other work, so people, you know, couldn't understand more of, you know, how my films are and the tone and what the, you know, the thinking behind of them was. Um, so I guess people understood that there's, you know, there's not much to discuss about it is like it is what it is <laughs> they, they didn't know where to, how to <laughs> approach the question I guess um, if it is believable of course it's not uh, but of course it is I mean at some point you you know you buy into it um, that and that's how cinema works you know you, if it works you can buy into anything um, if you if you believe it if you believe in it enough and the way you present it, then the audience will believe it as well. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, all the way in the back there. There's somebody waving a, desperately waving something red. Here we go. Congratulations again for the, for the film and the, all the success. Thank you. I have a two-parter question. It's a quick one, don't worry. Uh, one is, would you ever consider doing a musical or an action film? And second is, a lot of people in Greece are wondering when the film is going to come out in Greece. <clears throat> in Greece. Um, <laughs> yeah. That musical coming out. The, the musical is coming in to a theater near you very soon. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I would consider doing any kind of genre. I, I don't think it's about the genre. It's about you know if you if there's there's a story or a you know situation that you'd like to explore, and um, you know there's different ways of approaching it. And I guess I'm intrigued by doing different things and flirting with different genres. So you know, musical or action film, why not? Uh, I guess it wouldn't be. Uh, the most straightforward one, but <laughs> um, yeah, why not? And when the film is coming, when out, is in the film Greece, coming out in Greece, I don't know. I think end of January, maybe. Is someone's from Forksters? Yeah. yeah. How about a musical action film? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yorgos. Really a big admirer of your films. Um, how else has your experience in the theater informed how you direct cinema, and actors in cinema specifically? Uh, yes, well, th my experience in theater is yeah solely about actors, I guess, in, in, in connection to cinema. Uh, that's where I learned, because I was lucky enough to uh, work in theater before I made my first feature film. So, uh, and uh, again, we're quite fortunate in Greece, you have the, you have quite a bit of time to work before you stage a play. We could have up to you know three months of rehearsals uh, with the actors uh, before you stage a play. So it's great because you don't have to come with a preconceived notion of how the play is going to be, how you're going to stage it, what the what the, um, the set is going to be like. Um, you can discover all that by working with the actors and you can experiment and you can go to different directions and change where you're going according to how it feels, if it feels right or not. So um, working in theater uh, informed a lot the, 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 the way uh, to work with actors. Um, but not, but not 
the the actual outcome, not the actual result, not the mechanism of theater and how it works. Uh, it was just more a learning experience on h how I can get to where I want to go with the actors through rehearsals and through trying different things. But you were always aimed at cinema. Yeah, I was, and theater uh, was by chance uh, that I, I was offered to do the first play, and I, you know, I went like, why not? And um, yeah, and after I had that experience with working with actors, um, I, I did it again a few times because uh, I enjoyed that part of it. Not necessarily the the, the outcome, because you know you can't control it that much. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the other extreme, like you're afraid of when you're filming because, you, you know, it's going to stay forever as you're doing it. And then theater, you can't control it the, the moment that they're doing it and go like, no, it's not what we said. <laughs> we discussed this. We <laughs> okay. So you touched briefly uh, about starting in Greece, um, financing it yourself and, and getting started with your friends. What would you recommend for people today, filmmakers today, trying to, trying to move up? You mean in general? Or in, in general, in specific, specifically. <laughs> if we have time for a full break, no, I'm just, you know, whatever, whatever advice, I mean. Um, well, that, I guess, you know, just find any way you can to, to make the film. I mean, that's how we started. We, and was, there was a long period in Greece. I mean, Greece, as you probably know, never had like a, a huge tradition of filmmaking. And even making the decision to become a filmmaker in Greece, especially when I was growing up, it was quite strange. I mean, you couldn't really tell to anyone that you're going to make films. I mean, I, the way I started was like I went to film school supposedly to to learn how to make commercials. So because that felt like a viable uh, way to survive. Uh, there was no, you know, uh, dream of becoming a filmmaker in Greece. And of course, you know, you go into film school and you fall in love with all these filmmakers and all these films, and you do have a dream. But again, you know, it's not so uh, near. Um, and you know, deciding to start making films. I think we felt like, at some point, it felt like we were hypnotized, that we never realized that you, you can, you know, you can just, you know, take your f three friends and a camera and three actors, and why do you need all that support and the structure and in order to tell the story? And um, it was quite liberating when I, when I made my first film, Kineta, which was exactly like that, where like five people you know, 16 millimeter camera, no lights, no makeup, no hair, no nothing, just three actors. Um, and we started filming. And, uh, and it informed a lot of the way that I, uh, that I work until now, or, you know, part of it. You know, the fact that I started working like that, which came out of necessity, um, I, some parts of it I quite liked. And I, I've been trying to maintain them up to now. Um, so I guess, yeah, the answer to the question is just find any way, and especially now with technology, and you know, you can do films with your phone or whatever. Um, yeah, just find any way to make your own thing. Don't expect from others, at least in the beginning. Do you, do you still think, um, you still think like a film festival route would be the way to go, or do you think it would be better to is the film festival route the way to go? Um, well, it's always a great start, um, but I, it depends on the film on what the film is. Um, what were the th what are the things that you're trying to preserve from those first films? You just said you're trying to yeah. Maintain well, uh, I mean the fact that, for instance, uh, up until now we film with no no lights, you know, just natural light. Uh, makeup, I don't really like film makeup, so uh, actors in the films wear makeup only if the character is supposed to be wearing makeup, not, you know, coverage makeup to hide 
blemishes and imperfections and things like that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'd, li I'd like to keep the crew as small as possible, so we're flexible uh, and not distracted. So when we need to, you know, change our mind about something and be spontaneous, it's not like you have to, you know, move 200 people and you know, a hundred trucks. It's, it's hard to avoid that, especially in this film, which was a period film, and it had a lot of uh, practical needs. Uh, yeah, but try and keep it as intimate and as flexible and um, spontaneous as possible, uh, which was how we started. Um, yeah, things like that. With the way that you, in your answer to the last question, um, uh, technologically, it has become much easier to make a movie. It's you can get all the materials you need for relatively low cost now. But is there? Do you think that there's another danger in everything being too readily available and having to impose a different kind of discipline um, that came with you know 16 millimeter and with, with yeah, film? of course. And I, I I still shoot on film anyway. Um, well, I did a couple of films digitally, which I didn't enjoy. Um, but one of you know the aspects, and uh, sorry to bore you with technical stuff, but it's not really about that. It's uh, the fact that you know when you shoot on film, apart from the fact that I I think it looks much better, um, is you know the discipline that it brings. That everybody feels that you know there's something precious that is going through the camera. It's tactile. There's a transformation that's happening, you know, you don't see exactly what it's gonna look like, and then next day you see it and it's become something different, mostly much more beautiful and not uh, too real and removed from your reality. And, um, but the, the, the discipline that it brings, you know, you see the whole crew has a very different approach when you're, you're shooting on film, and the actors have a very different approach. You know, even the fact that you, you know, sometimes you hear the camera, you know, running while you're doing the scene, it brings a, a different um, type of concentration uh, by everyone. Um, and that's something that I cherish. Um, uh, and of course, you know, when there's more things of, of something, there's about to be more bad things of something, but also good things from it. So, you know, there's, there's no reason at this point of, in going like, okay, slow down, <laughs> limit the things that you're doing. Um, but I think, you know, even with uh, so many things around, the things that are gonna stand out are gonna stand out eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's always the pros and cons of technology. And Can you talk about what you're doing next? What's next on the horizon? Um, I don't know. I've um, I, I've uh, I've been developing three three or four scripts, which is the first time I actually do that. But it happened because they kind of piled up, making two films back to back: the Killing of a Sacred Deer and, and this one. Um, I kind of fell behind in my uh, development and, and writing, um, so I need to uh, refocus and. Um, and work on those scripts and figure out what's going to be the next. But it's very different things. There's a, it's an adaptation of a book. There's another film that I'm writing with Ephthemis Filippo that I've written most of my films with. There's another one that I'm writing with Tony that I wrote The Favorite with. And they're all very different. Some of them contemporary, some of them are period. Um, not a musical yet. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> But I hope some action in there. There's yeah. some action there. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. Here we go. Yorgos, thanks for coming. Thanks Thank for you making so much. such a great movie. Thanks.